every year, our graduating seniors choose the distinguished journalists they would most like to hear from at their commencement ceremony. This year's choice is the envy of graduating journalism students across the country. We are delighted that Pulitzer Prize winning Washington Post reporter David Farenthold is with us. Mr. Farenthold has the very interesting assignment of covering the Trump family and their business interests. He was awarded the Pulitzer Prize for national reporting just last month for his remarkable investigation into President Donald Trump's donations to charity. The investigation featured a novel use of Twitter as an investigative tool that also promoted transparency in his, throughout his reporting. A Houston native, Mr. Farenthold, has worked at the Post since his graduation from Harvard University in 2000. He previously covered Congress, the federal bureaucracy, the environment, and the District of Columbia Police. Please join me in welcoming David Farenthold. Thank you, Dean Dalglish, uh, and uh, thank you, graduates. Uh, this is your day. Uh, this is, your, this is the, your big day, and I'm so honored to be part of it. Um, for parents who don't know, uh, the graduates did this amazing thing to invite me to speak here, which was they uh, copied this thing that I had done last year trying to find Donald Trump's gifts to charity. I had taken notes on a sheet of notebook paper, taken pictures of that, and posted it on Twitter so people could see kind of the progress of my search. Um, and the graduates this year invited me sort of by using the same medium. They wrote messages about sort of an invitation, took pictures of them, posted them on Twitter. It was a wonderful thing to read them, such heartfelt messages. Most of them were heartfelt. Um, <laughs> one student um, tweeted a picture of a piece of paper with the words, I voted for someone else, heart. She actually drew a heart uh, after that message, which I appreciated it, until I realized it was probably meant for the person she voted for and not for me. Uh, so, uh, I want to just tell you a little bit about my experiences covering candidate Trump, Trump, President Trump, and a few of the lessons that I drew out of that. I feel like you guys are going into journalism, which to me is the greatest job in the world, the most fun job in the world. You're going into journalism at, at a time, at an incredibly vital time, a time that I think historians are going to look back on and judge the way that we as American journalists lived up to our ideals and lived up to our responsibilities in this era. So I could not be more excited to be talking to you now. So there's three lessons I sort of drew out of last year. I want to talk, talk to you a little bit about the experience and what I learned. So uh, as Dean Dalglish said, I have covered a lot of different things at the Post. Um, one of them, I'm going to say this without, I covered the Chesapeake Bay along the way. I'm going to say this with just a great, de great deal of humility. Before Donald Trump, before I covered the Trump Foundation, my greatest story was what I think might have been the greatest story ever about Maryland, the greatest newspaper story ever written about the state of Maryland. It was about an event on the Eastern Shore that combined three things. A, a beauty pageant, the world championships of competitive muskrat skinning, and a muskrat cookery contest. I actually ate a layer cake with pieces of muskrat in it uh, for that story. So, uh, until, but until 2016, uh, I had never really had an experience like covering candidate Trump. And that experience began with sort of a basic question, a simple question. I was writing about uh, this fundraiser. Candidate Trump, Donald Trump, had held this fundraiser. He was in a feud with Fox News, sort of an idea that seems impossible now. Uh, he was in a feud with Fox News and he skipped a Fox News debate, presidential debate. Instead, had his own fundraiser. He said he'd raised $6 million for veterans, to give to veterans charities, including a million dollars he'd given out of his own pocket. And I thought, well, I'll just ask where the money went. That was the simple question. Where did that money go? Who got that money? I thought I'd call him, I'd get the answer in a couple of days, write the story, and be on to something else. One of the things I've learned about myself is that I'm an optimist. I always believe that people are going to, I always believe the best of people. I always believe people are going to do what they say they're going to do, which as a reporter, and as especially as a political reporter, means that I'm constantly being surprised. Uh, things are always sneaking up on me. Uh, and so in this case, uh, when I called the Trump campaign to ask what had happened to the $6 million, I didn't get an answer. I didn't get it in a couple of days. I didn't get it in a couple of weeks. I didn't get it in a couple of months. Finally, I got to the end of May. Uh, so the fundraiser had been in January. I started asking questions in February. Got to the end of May, and I couldn't account for a lot of the money that Trump said he'd taken in to give to veterans. 
And especially I couldn't account for the million dollars he said was going to come out of his own pocket. I could find no evidence that he'd given it to anybody. Finally, then I got a break. Corey Lewandowski, who was Trump's campaign manager then, uh, called me and he said, okay, I can tell you now for sure, this is at the end of May last year, I can tell you for sure Donald Trump has given away his million dollars to charity now. But I can't tell you who got the money or in what amounts or when. All of that is secret. You just have to take my word for it. <laughs> so I was not a, as well trained as the Merrill College of Journalism has made you, but I knew you can't just take somebody's word for it, not about something that important. So I set out trying to figure out a way to check that. And I felt like I had already reached kind of the limits of what my journalism training had taught me. I'd called everybody I could think of to call. I'd emailed everybody I could think of to email. I'd, I'd done everything that I could sitting at my desk on my own. So I decided basically in desperation, I'm gonna open up my reporting and let people know what I'm trying to find out. So I spent a day on Twitter, on social media, posting, sending messages to various veterans organizations and saying, hey, have you gotten any of this million dollars Donald Trump says he's given away? Do you know anybody who's gotten even one dollar of this million dollars he gave away? And including Donald Trump's, at real Donald Trump, his handle in every one of those queries, knowing that he probably would spend that night searching for his own name on the internet and would find that I was looking for this money. So I spent that whole day searching online for this million dollars and I learned nothing. I found nobody who gotten even a dollar of the money. And it turned out that was because uh, there was no money. The money had never been given away. When Corey Lewandowski told me Trump had given away his million dollars, that was totally wrong. Uh, the money was still in Donald Trump's pocket. It was only after I made my public search that night Donald Trump actually gave the million dollars away. Uh, and he called me a couple days later. This actually was the last time I talked to him. Um, and he's President, now President Trump said, you know, I've given this million dollars away. He gave it to a veterans charity that was run by a friend of his who was a former FBI agent. And I said, why did it take you so long? You know, it, would you have given this money away if I hadn't asked about it? And uh, that's when he called me a nasty guy uh, and, and didn't answer the question. Uh, so the, the first lesson that I wanted, I've learned from this and I think might be useful to you all as you enter journalism is to do as much as you can to, to open yourself up, to show people how you know what you know, what you're looking for, what you want to know, to let people see the process you're going through. Both, that's both to combat the idea that what we do is fake news. People see the effort and care that we put into learning facts, the effort and care we put into checking facts. They're more likely to trust the final product. It's also because it gives people a thread to follow. People who are sort of lost in a tornado of news, as I'm sure you guys feel, and I feel definitely, if, people, if, if you show people how you're pursuing what you're pursuing day after day, they can return to it and pick up the thread and follow it. Last year, if you were lost in all kinds of different Trump news, you could come back to Twitter, you come to the Post homepage and see, oh yeah, there's the notebook guy. I know what he's doing, I know what he's looking for. Um, and the third thing is you open, if you open up your reporting, you invite in people, readers, who know things that you don't know, who know how to search for things that you can't find. As well trained as you are, we're all limited by our experience, by the systems we've learned how to use. And, and if you open up your process, you let people in who know more than you do. One great example of this last year, I was looking for a portrait of, of Donald Trump that Trump had bought with money from his charity. Uh, he'd used $10,000 from a charity to buy a giant portrait of himself. I needed to know where the portrait was. The law says if a charity buys something, it has to be used for a charitable purpose. So where was the portrait? It needed to know if it was hanging on the wall of a children's hospital someplace, some sort of charity, or was it hanging on the sports, in the wall of the sports bar in one of Donald Trump's resorts. Um, I just put that out on Twitter. I said, look, here's a, here's a portrait that I'm looking for. I have no idea where in the world it is. And it'll take me forever to go visit all the properties where it might be. One of my readers has an, had an idea that I had, would never have thought of. She went to the page, the TripAdvisor page. The, the TripAdvisor is a page where people can submit photos of their their recent hotel stay. She went to the TripAdvisor page for Donald Trump's golf resort at Doral. I never do that. I'm a Hampton Inn person. I don't try. I don't, I don't look for hotels. Uh, she there's 500 user-generated photos just of this one resort. There's a picture of the omelet station. There's a picture of one end of the buffet. There's a picture of the other end of the buffet. There's the 18th green. 350 photos down, she finds a picture of the portrait I'm looking for hanging on the wall of the sports bar at the at the Doral Resort. Uh, so th that happened in a, a few hours after I'd sent out my request. I then retweeted, said, look what we found. We know where the portrait was. The photo's dated February 2016. I need to know where it is. That same night, another reader, a guy who's a news anchor in Miami, 
realizes that he, his studio is four blocks away from Doral, makes a reservation, checks in, convinces the cleaning crew to let him into the sports bar, and finds it there on the wall in the flesh, apparently breaking the law. All that was possible within 14 hours. In the old days, it would have taken me days or even weeks to do that. That's the kind of thing you open yourself to, up to if you let people see more of what you're doing. Question number one. So after that experience with Trump's charity, uh, I spent the rest of the year sort of digging more broadly into whether he'd followed it up on previous promises to give to charity. Uh, we found all kinds of things. We found that he um, had promised millions of dollars to charity over a period of several years. Um, but I could, looking for evidence that he'd actually given that money, I could only find evidence of one gift out of his own pocket between 2008 and 2015. That gift was for less than $10,000. Um, we also found that he used this charity that he ran that was filled with other people's money to buy portraits of himself, to uh, pay off his business's legal debts, to pay campaign contributions. And then in the process of all that, reporting on Trump's charity, uh, I stumbled ac across a video um, from 2005 in which Trump was appearing on Access Hollywood. And into a hot mic, he bragged that he could uh, sexually grope women whenever he wanted to. And then if you're a star, they let you do it. So for a time, that seemed like it was going to be one of the biggest stories of this election. It seemed like that Access Hollywood story, my story, might be something that really changed the outcome of the election. And at that point in, August, in October of last year, I was interviewed by a, a German reporter um, who showed the effervescence and uh, optimism that Germans are known for. Uh, he asked me, so this is, again, a time when I'm feeling really good about this journalism that I've done and the impact of it. He said, do you think this is the peak of your life? And then, fast forward a couple of weeks, Donald Trump wins the election. I was interviewed by another German reporter a couple days later. In similarly effervescent style, he asked me, do you think perhaps none of it mattered at all? <laughs> the second lesson I have for you is that you should never listen to the people who say that nothing matters, who say that what we do don't, doesn't matter. There's going to be a lot of people, no matter what you write about, no matter what you cover, for whatever medium, who say, Whatever you're doing, look, people don't care about it. Nobody, it's not having any impact. It doesn't matter. It's the wrong lesson to draw from anything we cover. It's especially the wrong lesson to draw from our coverage of Donald Trump, right? Our point was not to bring Donald Trump down. It was to give people enough information about his character and his past actions that they could go into the voting booth well-informed, right? We did that job. The voters did their job. Uh, and I think if Hillary Clinton had won, there'd be a lot of reporters who covered Hillary Clinton. People would have been asking, did it all not, you know, did, did nothing matter? Did nothing you did matter? The thing I, I want to tell you guys is no matter what you do, no matter what you cover, uh, you can never outsource your sense of what's right and wrong. You can never outsource your sense of outrage or interest to other people. It's never the right thing to let other people decide what you think is important. If you think, that you think something is interesting, if you think something is outrageous, if you think something people need to know about something, follow that. Other people will, will, will follow behind you. I just was watching the end of All the President's Men the other day. Great movie if you haven't seen it. Uh, there's a scene at the end, very end of the movie, where ben, the, the actor playing Ben Bradley is talking to Woodward and Bernstein, and he says to them, have you seen the results of the latest Gallup poll? Half the country's never even heard of the word Watergate. Okay, the message that followed was not, nothing matters, let's go home. The message was, get back to work. This is, the, if you think that this, this is something that the country's future rides on, and it doesn't matter if the country doesn't know it yet, we know it, we have to follow it. So don't outsource your sense of outrage, follow it and let other people follow, follow you. The last thing I wanted to talk about is more broad, and that's about the moment we're in now in journalism, and I think the, the question you're going to hear a lot, no matter what you cover. I hear it a lot with relation to Donald Trump, which is that there's a war between the media and people we cover. You've heard us described as fake news, the enemy of the people. There's a, there's a tendency of among, and there's a tendency on both left and right to sort of buy into that idea that Donald Trump and the media are at war. That's the wrong message to learn. And it'll be the wrong message no matter what you cover. In a war, what do you do in a war? You bend the rules. You break the rules. You adopt your enemy's tactics. It's, that's never the thing we, the, the thing that, got, that gives us our power, the thing that gives us our credibility, is the fact that we always, we've, we're cautious. We follow the rules. We check facts. You can never absorb the idea that you're at war with someone that you're covering because it leads you then to bend the rules and break the rules because the outcome is to get them. That's never our intention. The, the great, I'm going to steal from my editor, Marty Barron, who said this really fascinating and I think perfect motto for journalism now, which is we're not at war, we're at work, okay? And the way to do that work the best 
is to show the work we're doing, to let people understand it and, 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 uh, and help if they can, but to remember always that it's not a war, it's our job. So uh, thank you, God bless you, and as you go into the most fun job in the world.